So this is joint work with many collaborators, including Rishabh Singh and Kevin Ellis, who are in the audience. Here's the same Kevin that Edmundo talked about. So let me start with a story that started this, this all. Eight years ago, I was returning from a conference in an airplane, and there was a lady seated next to me. She was very impressed to know that I work for Microsoft Research and that I have a PhD in computer science. So I ought to be able to help her with the task that she was struggling with. She opens up her laptop, fires up Excel, shows me a column of strings that she wants to map to a different format, and asks me for a script to do that. So at that time, I had to excuse myself out of the situation because I had no idea about the programming model underneath Excel. But the first thing I did after I got back home was to go and look at help forums. And I noticed that there were many, many people who were struggling with simple, repetitive tasks like that airplane lady. And the way these people would describe their intent to an expert on a help forum is by giving an input-output example. So in this case, the end user asks the expert to give them a program that can translate the string on the left side of the arrow to the string on the right side of the arrow. The expert looks at this example, gives them back a program which extracts two characters starting from the fifth character. The end user observes that this program does not do the right job on other input that they have in their data set and sends the other example to the expert. So what do you think is the end user trying to do here? So extract the substring between the first two underscore. And one of the simplest programs that you can write in Excel using the programming model and the APIs that it exposes is this one. The end user takes this program and observes that it does the right job on the data set and sends a thank you to the expert. So this is the interaction that we automated, and now it ships as a feature called Flash Fill inside Excel. So let me walk you through a quick demo of this capability. So here I have a bunch of social security numbers. Suppose I want to format them by inserting hyphens, as you see in the second column, and I want to mask off some digits. So if you're not a programmer, so 99% people who use Excel do not know programming, you'll be stuck if there are hundreds and thousands of rows. But now with Flash Fill, you can give an example of what you want and press Control E to fire this feature. So the system takes a look at this input-output example, generalizes it into a program, and runs that program on the rest of the data to give you the output. The Excel team did a quite a good job at avoiding the so-called discoverability issue. So imagine that you don't know that this feature exists. So you're simply trying to extract the last name from this email. And the moment you try to do the same computation for the second row, the system auto-fires. It realizes that you're not trying to compute an arbitrary column, but a column that is a derivative of the existing input columns. Now, in general, it may be too good to read the mind of the user from just one example, as this scenario illustrates. Here I have a bunch of medical billing codes, some of which have a right bracket at the end, some of which don't. Suppose I want to clean this data by adding a right bracket wherever it is missing. If I give one example, another way to fire flash fill is to go to the data tab and click flash fill. The system will come up with the simplest generalization, which is to add a right bracket everywhere. Maybe this is what you want and you are done. Otherwise, you will observe that rows 6 to 10 are incorrect. And you can fix any one of these, which translates to giving a second input-output example to the tool. And now the tool can better generalize to the intent that you have in mind. Here is another common scenario where we have a large string with many different fields. Even if you're a programmer, thinking of a logic to extract these fields would take a lot of time. But now you can simply give an example and press Control e Flash will can synthesize quite complicated programs, in particular programs that contain loops. So here I'm trying to generate an abbreviation, and it just works from one example. I may not put spaces, I can do lowercase, I can put periods, and it will all work. So this is my last demo. So here I'm trying to extract the first letter, and it works as expected. I'm trying to extract the first two letters. What do you think I'm trying to do here? first three, right? Now, if you didn't watch me doing these first three columns, what do you think I'm trying to do here? What is your most natural interpretation? It's the first name, right? And that's what the system also thinks. But if you really want the first four characters, all that you have to do is to give one more example, and the system will generalize to your uh, intent. Uh, so my favorite is this one, where I'm trying to compute the initials. 
and a system can do this with one example. And it is smart enough to figure out that the lowercase f here comes from lower casing of the capital F in Foster as opposed to the other occurrences of lower f inside GF. So now there are lots of scenarios which also do not work. So there is pretty much no limit to the intelligence that you can put behind such a feature. But the amazing thing that we were able to do was to start looking at tasks that people are trying to do, which Flashville did not support. And then we extended the underlying domain-specific language in order to be able to uh, do those tasks. So here is a sample of those tasks. So suppose you want to round off numbers to two decimal places. If you're programming in Excel or C-sharp, you need to remember this format descriptor. What about in Python and C? This one. In Java, you have to remember another format descriptor. So even for a task as simple as rounding off numbers, input-output examples can be a very natural way to specify your intent. So now, with a new version of Flashville that ships inside a product called Azure Machine Learning Workbench, these kinds of number and date transformations can also be accomplished from very few examples. So here's another scenario where I have a large string, and I want to extract the red date and map it to the corresponding weekday. I want to extract the green time and map it to the three-hour bucket that it belongs to. It's called a bucketing transformation. Imagine the amount of code that you'll have to write to do these kinds of tasks. But the newer version of Flashville in Azure Machine Learning can do this from simply one example. So now what else can we do besides map operations? How about filter operations? So let me now show you a different kind of task domain which we can help automate using the same kind of methodologies. This is a real assignment taken from a data science class where the challenge is to take this big text file and extract structured data out of it. The instructor provides the students a script to build on top of to be able to go from left to right. But now let me show you how this kind of experience would look like using a programming by example technology. So I have loaded the same file here. And let's say I want to extract the championship name. So after I give a couple of examples, the system is able to learn a script that can extract other such instances of this field from the document. If I want to extract other fields, I simply change the color of the highlighter. In this case, one example suffices because my previous interaction has already put some structure on the document. I can go ahead and extract other fields, such as the score. Now, in this case, the system does not get it right in the third record. Now, I can give one more example and fix it. But what if this error was not in your viewport? It was somewhere in the middle of the big data that you're trying to transform and manipulate. If you are programming this task yourself, the correctness of the program or the parser that you write is completely in your own hands. But here, since you're not programming by committing to a specific implementation, but you're programming by describing your intent or the specification at a higher level, we can do much more. For instance, we can take the top rank programs that the system generated from the first few examples and run all of them on the entire data set or part of the data set to figure out where are the places where the two programs or high-rank programs differ in their execution results? And if we do that, the system actually points out that this third record is actually ambiguous, and the user might want to take a look at it. And indeed, this is the place where the problem is. So if I give one more example, the system is able to now extract the right stuff from the rest of the data set. Now, this was all about analyzing strings or text. But oftentimes, data comes in many different formats with the structure. You might have web pages that have underlying tree structure on them. You might have PDF documents from which you want to extract tables, where you might want to manipulate images at the pixel level. Or you might want to deal with the grid structure that is common in spreadsheets. So let me walk you through this one more demo in this space of manipulating grid structures. So on the left side, you have what is called a semi-structured spreadsheet. So apparently, 50% spreadsheets are semi-structured, and they're not easy to reason about unless you can translate the data into a normalized form. But now, with our innovations in programming by example, we can accomplish such tasks simply by providing few examples of the normalized table. So let me show you a quick demo of uh, this capability. So here I have a top, uh, set of top cited authors in Popple 2015, and this kind of information repeats itself. 
Suppose I want to figure out who the most cited author across all these different conference editions is. If all this data was in a proper table, then I can write a SQL query myself, or we can use programming by natural language kind of technologies. But the trouble is that the data is not in a normalized format. So in order to convert it into a normalized format, I will simply tell my tool that I want to create an output table with three columns. The names of these columns don't really matter. So I'll give examples of what should be there in this output table. So this is one record. And I'll give an example of another record to make it more representative to the tool as to what is it that I'm trying to do. And simply from a couple of examples, the tool is now able to learn a program which can extract other such tuples from this semi-structured spreadsheet. So now let's see how these technologies actually uh, work. So at the heart of these different technologies, there's a search engine which maps the examples provided by the user into a program. Now instead of searching over a general purpose programming language, we restrict the search to an underlying domain specific language to be able to tame the search. But still, the search won't be tractable if you were to do some kind of exhaustive brute force search, because uh, the, these domain specific languages are still uh, infinite. They still represent an infinite collection of programs. So this is where we use combination of logical reasoning techniques and machine learning techniques in a very interesting way to make the search tractable. And I will briefly talk about this on some of my next slides. So we prune the search space using logical reasoning techniques, and then we guide using machine learning among the various choices that remain. So what this process produces is actually not a program, but a set of programs that are consistent with the examples that are provided by the user. And now we have to deal with the under specification that is very much inherent in these examples. And for that, what we do is we use ranking techniques to be able to rank the different programs that are consistent with the examples that have been provided by the user. And these techniques leverage features of the programs that have been synthesized, but also features of the inputs and outputs that these programs generate. And then we build some models over these kinds of features to be able to get our ranking function. And then we have a disambiguation utility which looks at the various programs that have been generated and the rest of inputs that are available in the data set on which these programs need to be executed and makes use of this rich information to guide an active learning session uh, with the user. And once the system is confident that there is not much ambiguity left in the task, the system can actually give a program to the user in the underlying domain specific language D, which can then be translated into a target programming language of your choice, such as Python or Java and so on. So let's see what these domain specific languages look like. So the language underneath Flash Fill uses some fundamental operations for doing string transformations, such as a concatenate expression. So these languages can be easily described using grammars. So what are we concatenating? We're concatenating substrings of the input strings, or we are also inserting some constant strings in the middle. At the top, we have a limited form of conditional to take care of different kinds of formats of the data that might be there in the input. We have limited kinds of loops and operations to manipulate numbers and dates and so forth. Now, let's see how we use logical reasoning techniques to search for programs that are, specified, uh, in, that is in the DSL that is specified using a grammar. So the key idea here is that we reduce the problem of searching for programs in grammar G that satisfy an input-output example phi uh, to simpler problems using a divide and conquer style uh, reduction. So this rule says, that the set, of all, the set of all programs in Grammar G that satisfy two input-output examples, V1 and V2, can be obtained by computing the set of all programs in Grammar G that satisfy the first example and intersecting that set with the set of all programs in Grammar G that satisfy the second input-output example. Now, this is the first algorithm that we implemented inside FlashFill, and the performance was a few seconds, which was unacceptable to the Excel team to be able to ship out this technology. The performance needed to be more real-time under a second. So then we use another reduction technique there. So we first compute the set of all programs in Grammar G that satisfy the first input-output example, and then use this remaining uh, uh, grammar to search for all programs in it that satisfy the second input-output example. And it turns out that this algorithmic reduction is what gives us the real-time efficiency that you see inside Excel. Here is another rule which says that if the Grammar G is a union of two grammars, G1 and G2, then the set of programs in Grammar G that satisfy some specification can simply be obtained by solving these simpler green problems over the respective uh, grammars. And now this is the most interesting rule of all. So if there's one thing that you want to take from my talk today, it is actually this rule that, is, that shows how we handle the base case that we have. 
So let's say the grammar has a function application f on top of it, and I want to find all programs in the grammar g that on input i give me the output o. So the rule for this will leverage use of what I call function inverses. So let me define what a function inverse is. Um, intuitively, it is the set of all inputs to a function that will yield a specific output. So for instance, if you have a concatenate operator, the inverse of concatenate on the output ABC is going to be all splits of this string uh, ABC. So now what we first do is we compute the inverse of O under F, and we obtain, let's say, these two different input states. And now you can easily write down uh, what the reduction is going to be. So now you solve these simpler green problems, where I first try to compute all programs in G1 that yield U, and all programs in G2 that yield V, and compose them together like this. And I can do the same thing with U prime and V prime. Yeah. So this is how we push down the uh, obligation that we have at the top level of the grammar to smaller levels in the grammar. Uh, this is also called weakest precondition computation in program analysis. You might also liken this to how backpropagation works in uh, machine learning. And now what we have is, uh, instead of 1,000 goals at each level, let's say now this kind of technique gives us three goals at each level. Uh, and now we use machine learning to predict which of these three sub-goals do we want to try first. And when we use uh, standard LSTM uh, architectures here, we obtain a speed above up to 20x on some of our uh, flashful uh, benchmarks. Let me take a, show you a quick peek into how ranking works. So let's say I want to uh, generate initials from just one example. Uh, these are the three of the many different programs that we can synthesize from just one example, but only the third one is correct. Uh, so if you look at uh, uh, features that talk about how many constants are being used in the program or how large are those constants, we can use these kinds of syntactic features of the program to get a ranking function that can prefer the intended program from among other programs that also happen to be consistent with the example that the user provided. Uh, now let's take a look at another example. So here, if you recall, I was trying to insert a right bracket wherever it was missing. So if I give only the first example, the system can generate these two programs. But if I simply go by cohomographic complexity of these programs or the simplicity of these programs, I might end up preferring P1 over P2. But we know that P1 is not the right program. P2 is actually the intended program. So what kind of features can we use to prefer P2? Uh, so what we do is we execute these programs on the other inputs that are available, and we observe that P1 ends up generating results that are not very uh, uh, uniform, but P2 generates results that are more uniform, and these kinds of output features allow us to pick P2 over P1. And I already talked a little bit about disambiguation as to how can we guide interactivity with the user, how can we provide debugging aids to the user in this new form of programming. So the idea there is that we look at the behavior of these different programs that have been synthesized on the inputs, and we highlight those differences to the user, and I showed you this demo earlier. But we can also highlight ambiguity based upon clustering the inputs or the outputs that these programs generate to figure out the various kinds of use cases. And this is where standard machine learning techniques are also very helpful. So what you see here uh, that, that has been happening in all these different components that I showed you related to search, ranking, and disambiguation, so they were instances of what I described in piece of an intelligent software. And if we dig deeper, deeper into uh, uh, these kinds of softwares, we might realize that they have two kinds of components there. One is uh, programming that is very standard, uh, algorithms that you already know, uh, what, uh, how to solve certain things like computing shortest path or sorting an array, and something which I call creative heuristics. And if you further dig down deeper into these uh, creative heuristics, you will observe that they are made up of interest, various kinds of features and models that the developer has written. So the proposal that I'm making here is that the logical strategies and features can be authored by developers, but the models that they typically hand tune, can, their, their discovery can be phrased as a machine learning problem, and they can be generated uh, by an ML-backed runtime. Uh, so for instance, there's a constant like 0.6 you know, in our code base that I once observed. And I asked the researcher that why is this constant there? He said, well, this is what gives us you know, the best performance on our benchmark. But if you can phrase the discovery of that constant 0.6 as an ML problem, we can not only get a better constant 0.62, but furthermore, these constants can be generated much faster, and they can be tuned to different kinds of workloads that different users are going to be using uh, in the future. Uh, so I showed you three different instances of how standard programming or logical reasoning 
can come hand to hand with machine learning to create the kinds of components that we needed in PBE. But I believe that this kind of decomposition applies more generally to other construction of intelligent software components as well. So now, before concluding, uh, let me talk about some uh, other frontiers in this more general space of program synthesis. So instead of searching for programs over an underlying programming language, search can sometimes often also be done by searching over existing code repositories. So some very nice piece of work from Surat Chaudhary at Rice University and his colleagues that appears at, uh, appeared at ICLAR uh, this year. Uh, then instead of learning programs, standard programs, we can also learn different kinds of neural architectures, and Dawn earlier touched upon this in her talk. Now the applications that I showed you were mostly in the space of so-called data transformations. But you can imagine doing repetitive code transformations also using similar kind of interaction model. It turns out that when we have to do some kind of application migration, such as move the application from an old version of a platform to a new version of a platform or to a different competing platform, 40% developer time goes into doing repetitive code edits, doing repetitive refactoring. But you can imagine the developer can give one or two examples of the edits they want to do, and the system can automate the rest. Another very fascinating application of these techniques is in the space of constructing intelligent tutoring systems. So once the machine becomes smart enough to understand examples and natural language, the same kind of technology can be used in reverse to start teaching uh, uh, humans about different kinds of subjects. Now, the intent can be specified not just by examples, but there are many cases where intent is more naturally described using natural language. So some nice piece of work from Rishabh Singh and his colleagues that appears at uh, NACL uh, this year. Sometimes intent can be specified quite implicitly. So when we first worked on FlashFill, the Excel team refused to ship FlashFill unless we brought it down to be working with one example on many simple cases. The first version of FlashFill required three to four examples per task. And once we got there, and then the Excel team became more confident to ship this experience to the users. Several months ago, I was challenged by another product team. Can we make the experience even better? Can you beat one input-output example? Right? So it turns out that in some cases, it actually makes a lot of sense. So for instance, I showed you a demo of parsing a log file, where I gave one or two examples of the various fields I wanted to extract, which is way better than writing a parser yourself. But imagine that there are lots of fields, tens or hundreds of fields. Then giving one to two examples of each field will also become very tedious. But these are the cases where it is very clear to a human being what the various fields in the document are, and there's a potential for us to completely automate it. And I'll show you a quick demo of this uh, capability before concluding. Uh, and the other very interesting uh, aspect here is that instead of just generating the program under the hood and automating the task for the user, can we show this program to the user in a form that will be readable and modifiable? Because developers and data scientists want full transparency into the underlying system. They don't trust this kind of magic. So let me walk through a very quick demo of this capability uh, before concluding. So I'll show you aspects of how predictivity looks like and uh, uh, the readable code that we generate. So this demo is in the context of using the Jupyter Notebook uh, frame. And I'm going to be generating a Python code or PySpark code. So here I have a a uh, text file that contains 911 call records. At the beginning, there is some metadata. Then there's a header line. And then each row contains a single 911 call record entry. There is the location where the 911 call uh, was created from, the date and time, and so on. Suppose I want to analyze this data to figure out when are 911 calls most common. Is it on Monday mornings or Friday evenings? We gave this challenge to Python programmers. They took 30 minutes on average to do it. But we can do this now in a minute using the program synthesis APIs that we have. So if you recall, I talked talk to you about a technology for reading a file into a table. Now in this case, the file is simple. I don't need to give any input-output examples. I simply point the name of the file to the API that we have, uh, file open, and the system automatically generates code for you. Quite readable code. You might not be familiar with the PySpark APIs that are available to handle big data. You might normally go to Stack Overflow, figure out the right set of APIs, or for each other field, you have to specify what the data type is. But now, even this rather simple task is completely automated for you, saving you several minutes. And once you execute this uh, program, you get a data frame. You can count how many entries are in the data frame. It tells you 326,000 entries. You can look at what the data frame looks like. And now what we want to do is to extract the weekday and the bucket from this time in order to figure out whether it is like Monday morning or Friday evenings. And we'll do this by using FlashFill API. 
So I simply give uh, to the Flashfill API for computing a drive column, one input output example. So this is the input before the comma, and this is the output. And simply from one input output example, the system is able to actually generate this Python code for me. Right? Fairly readable. There are many interesting challenges here, what variable names you use, how do you even format this code for the user. Um, if you want to generate buckets of six hours instead of three hours, you can simply change it. I didn't know that percentage A was used to actually convert the date into the corresponding weekday. There's a lot of learnings uh, to also be uh, happening from here. You can also use this kind of thing for educational purposes also. And now, uh, when I run this code, I simply get the uh, new drive column uh, at the very end, and you can easily plot it. Uh, and you would know that most 9 calls now happens on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to uh, 6 p.m. So let me conclude here. Uh, so program synthesis is already become a reality today. Many of these APIs that I showed you and many more actually ship in mass market real products. There are several domains where we are already providing 10 to 100x productivity increase to developers. The two killer domains in my mind are data wrangling, where data scientists are spending 80% of their time trying to transform data, clean data, before they can start building machine learning models, and code refactoring, which involves many repetitive code edits. But to me, even the more useful aspect here is that of bringing programming to the masses. 99% people do not know programming, but these are not stupid people, and these technologies can enable these people to program. If you look at the techniques under the hood, for the various components that we have inside of our programming by example technologies, we combine logical reasoning and machine learning in very interesting ways. And I believe that there are a lot more foundational advances waiting to be happening along this line of work. If you look at the history of programming, we went from punched cards and low-level programming languages to high-level programming languages and beautiful code editors. The next evolution, I believe, is going to take programming closer to human communication. And there will be three components that would be required, composition, which, by the way, is already present in programming today using the semicolon operator and the use of procedural boundaries. But two new components that are required are that of examples and natural language. These are already implicitly present today. So for instance, when we write test cases, these are nothing more than input-output examples. When we write comments in our code, they are just like natural language-based specifications. But these are not used as first-class citizens in code authoring process. And I believe that this is what is going to happen in the next evolution of programming. So I run a research and engineering team at Microsoft that develops many of these APIs and ships them into products from Microsoft. But we also make this technology available for public academic use. And you're welcome to try that out by going to this particular site. Thank you. And I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. So the guarantee that we have is that if the task that you want to do can be done by a program in the underlying domain specific language, the algorithms will do it. They are complete algorithms. If the task that you're trying to do is not expressible by any program in the underlying domain specific language, we won't be able to do it. And the system will say, sorry, I cannot figure out the pattern in your data. But as scientists, what we do is try to see what kinds of tasks are people trying to do. So if a lot of people in the world would want to convert i to the ith prime number, we will go ahead and add the support for it in the underlying domain specific language. But people don't. So we have to be very careful about what kinds of dimensions do we grow the underlying domain specific language to, because there is no limit to the amount of intelligence that you can put here. Whatever you develop, there will always be tasks that cannot be done. So what fundamental operators go into it, we determine that by seeing what kinds of pain points do people have. Uh, but the other thing that, that uh, is also important here is that we need to realize the limitations of these kinds of AI technologies. So it is always better to try to bake in interaction as a first-class citizen inside these capabilities. So maybe the task that you're trying to do cannot be done completely automatically, but if the user can decompose that task into two different subtasks, and each of those subtasks can be done automatically, that would be also be the way forward. So the short answer to your question is no. Today, we do not support such complicated mathematical operators. But as I said, that it is not hard to add it. But then there will always be cases that, that we won't be able to do. So interactivity is also a better way to uh, march along. So can you speak into 
the mic because we are doing recording. So you need to, uh, yeah, be great if you can. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, so uh, as I understand it, you're using machine learning to help capture some of the knowledge about what are the typical things that people do and what the typical problems are that people need to automate. So it seems like there's a lot of interesting information here that's been brought to bear about the statistics of the tasks that people are using. Um, can you say a little bit about how that happened? Is there like some sort of like large repository of tasks that people have, you know, done in the past, or do you have like sort of like test users? It's some sort of crowdsourcing scheme. It's a great question. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, asking that. Uh, so we are uh, going to be releasing a data set of real tasks. So all our models that we have built, machine learning models that we have built, have been trained all from real tasks. There's no synthetic data out there. And the number of tasks that we have in our collection, they have all been collected from help forums or talking to customers, uh, getting real scenarios. The number of such tasks is around 10,000. But what happens is that inside each task, you get many instances of what works correctly and what doesn't work correctly. So for instance, let's say you want to create a ranking function. Then for each task, I have millions of programs that do the right job, billions of programs that don't do the right job, and one task can generate so much of amount of training data for our systems to be able to actually operate. And that's how we have been able to build machine learning models, even with a limited set of real-world tasks. And we are hopefully, hopefully going to be soon releasing them.